All right. So um, first thing first, um, if you can briefly describe what serious strength is and what you do. Um, briefly? <laughs> yes. Well, you know, uh, serious strength. Well, this is a one-on-one -on -one personal training center. It's not a general membership gym like a lot of typical gyms. So in other words, we don't let anybody come in and just train on their own. So uh, every time a client comes in, they have their trainer and their or their instructor, I like to call it. And the instructor has a chart with all of the progress, uh, the seat settings and the weights and the pro we call it a progress chart of each client, and <clears throat> um, takes them into the into the gym and puts them through either a 15 minute or a 25 minute uh, a one on one strength training workout using what we call here the slow burn system of strength training, which is lifting weights in a very slow but intense fashion. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm the owner, and I'm one of the instructors. We have uh, six instructors here, and um, we recommend that people come twice a week. And once is good, too, but twice. We find that twice weekly training is superior, is better. You get better results, and you get it faster, certainly. And even, in, and even with some beginners, we recommend that they come maybe three times a week for the first, you know, two, three weeks, if, if they can afford it, if they can make the time. Uh, because the faster you learn how to exercise intensely, the better the results will be, and um, the more act, the more quickly you will become acclimated to intense effort. So that's pretty much in a nutshell, which what we do, and we also uh, educate as best as we can people on proper nutrition, and we feel that uh, a real food what's now being called a paleo diet, low carbohydrate, low sugar, or, or really a normal carbohydrate diet, an amount of sugars, vegetables, fruits, and that are adequate uh, to meet uh, all of a person's um, uh, free fatty acid micronutrient needs. So the, we feel that the combination of eating healthfully in the way I just described with twice a week strength training gives a person the very best health and physical, um, uh, what's the right word, uh, physical fitness that they can have without putting themselves in, in harm's way. What do you mean by harm's way? Like for example, uh, CrossFit might be the best example of what a lot of people are doing today <clears throat> to uh, become fit or fitter or healthier. But CrossFit, like, or maybe a, a more, uh, a better example might be uh, boxing, or kickboxing, or, or martial arts, like uh, uh, jiu-jitsu, or something of that nature, where it goes without saying that there are inherent dangers. If you want to, if you want to take boxing, you want to take kickboxing, you want to take martial arts like karate, um, you're going to get hurt. Not maybe, you're going to get hurt. <laughs> but you know that going in. You're like, all right, I'm going to take, I accept the risk. You know, you, know how you, you can't box without getting hurt. You can't right. do martial arts without getting hurt. It's just not possible. Um, the same thing with CrossFit and other forms of, uh, you know, physical fitness regimens where I think people, they, 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 they have an image of what they want to be. They see themselves as this either tough guy or fit guy or gal and they put themselves in harm's way needlessly so it is possible to become leaner more muscular to improve your bone mineral density uh, improve your cholesterol profile uh, anything that you can think of that exercise typically bestows upon somebody without ever getting hurt without ever being injured so uh, a lot of people just don't realize that, and uh, uh, the sensationalism of things like CrossFit often lead people into physical fitness regimens that wind up hurting them, and sometimes permanently, you know, especially when you're older. Speaking of, uh, of permanent injury, now there's a lot of um, ways people go about rehab when they get injured. Yeah. Um, is there anything specific that you guys do over here for somebody that has a previous injury that's yeah. coming to do a one-on-one -on -one training session? Well, 
uh, and you might know this already, but physical therapy, what's typically, you know, when you say, well, I, I need physical therapy. Uh, many years ago when physical therapy was first invented, uh, back in, I mean, who knows when it was first invented, but way back during the time of, you know, First, Second World War and between that time when physical therapy started to be, um, become popularized by, uh, you know, DeLorme, Thomas DeLorme and Watkins, uh, strengthening the muscles was the therapy. Beyond the doctor doing whatever a doctor does for that particular injury, once the doctor was finished with what they were doing and then handed the patient to the therapist, the, the main focus of the therapy was making that person stronger again. Today, that has sort of been lost a little bit, and now I ran a physical therapy clinic uh, for several years uh, in Brooklyn and worked for the Hospital for Joint Diseases uh, Sports Medicine Center back in, like, from 1990 to 1992. And modality, passive modalities started to become, you know, what the focus was. So you do ultrasound and heat and ice and electric stimulation and TENS units and all this kind of stuff. Um, and the strengthening aspect of it was just like a small part of it. Oh, okay. What we do is primarily, if not solely, making the person stronger. And with added muscular strength comes a host of other physio physiological benefits. Um, but making uh, the muscles that surround the joint stronger support that joint. Um, so depending upon what the injury is, our basic focus is to find what we can do with that client. We don't really worry so much about what we can't do. Obviously, there will be things. So if somebody went skiing and had a knee injury, and let's say they uh, tore, completely tore their ACL, but they opt out of surgery because they're not a professional athlete, they don't really feel like going through that kind of surgery to repair the ACL, now the focus would be to make the muscles that surround the knee, the ACL is the ligament in the knee that keeps the, 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 the tibia from sliding forward on the, on the femur. So like when you're running on a basketball court and you stop, what keeps the lower leg from, keep, from going is the ACL. And it's a common injury in basketball and skiing and many other uh, sports where there's a lot of stops and starts. So now that person who's opted out of surgery needs to make all the muscles that surround the knee joint as strong as you can possibly make them. So, um, and since that's our specialty, uh, and because the technique that we use is uh, the very slow, controlled, um, you know, again, what we call the slow burn technique, uh, there really is no better way to rehab a person than to do what we do. and and. And, and that's pretty much how I started thinking about this technique uh, was when I was um, working at the hospital for joint diseases and I was in charge of all of the strengthening programs for all of the uh, patients. So the doctor would fix him, physical therapist would do all the things that only a physical therapist is licensed to do, and then they would hand them off to me. And they'd say, Fred, you know, strengthen Joe's shoulder, strengthen Mary's knee. Uh, strengthen her hips, here are some guidelines. And so I had to think about wh how, what was the best way to do that? You know, so little by little I started reading and I read about uh, what was called <clears throat> back in the, I guess it was like maybe the 40s or 50s, it was popularized then, called muscular contractions with measured movement, MCMM. And this was a strength training technique used by like the uh, uh, strength enthusiasts back in those days to break plateaus. And they literally said, and I have an article from Strength and Health magazine from 1962, they literally said, lift the weights in 10 seconds, lower the weights in 10 seconds. Like make the weights lighter than the weights that you would normally use. Because a lot of times these guys would be doing cleans oh, yeah. and snatches. And so what you're doing when you're using those kinds of techniques is you're literally kind of like taking a very heavy weight and ducking underneath it. And you're kind of using technique to toss, hoist, throw very heavy weights into certain positions. Um, so instead of things like that, you would take a lighter weight and you would use very, very slow and controlled movements. So this way you're minimizing the role that momentum uh, and uh, those techniques would uh, impart 
and you're maximizing the work of the muscles. And so by doing that, they found that this broke plateaus. So the more I read about that, and then I read a lot of books by Dr. Ellington Darden, <clears throat> who back in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, popularized high helped to popularize high intensity training. And in his books, he talked about uh, super slow training. So I started to read a lot about that and got involved with that and then realized that it was working really well with the patients that where, uh, let's just say, 65-year-old Mary Smith who had hurt her knee falling down a flight of stairs was having pain when she did a leg machine the normal way, the lift, lower, lift, yeah. lower. When I slowed her down, we were able to bypass, in many instances, we could bypass, because she would lift slow, and then she might say, ah, that hurts, that hurts. I'd say, okay, slow it down, slow it down. And then she could continue and move through it without feeling that pain. So we were getting people, I, you know, we, we were getting people very, very strong, very fast, with much less um, pain and discomfort. And so then I thought, well, if it's good for these patients, why wouldn't it be better for like everybody else? And so I started training uh, when, the, when the original Equinox opened down the street here, I was one of the trainers there, and I started training all my clients like that. And they were like, wow, I've never felt this. You know, in like 20, 20 30 minutes, they were like jelly. <laughs> um, and there seems to be a lot of good evidence to suggest that a higher effort level is superior for building strength than a low level of effort, but a lot of it. So, um, so not only was it safer, not only was it better at eliciting the, the, the benefits, but it was more efficient, more time efficient. Right. So only, what, uh, 15 to 20 minutes? Yeah, and the actual amount of time you're actually exercising is can be even less than that. I mean, you might be in the gym for 30 minutes, but the actual, if you do 10 different exercises and you fatigue your muscles in each exercise in, say, 50 to 60 seconds, which we typically do here, uh, you're exercising for as little as 10 to 15 minutes. So do you, did you suggest that as, as a general range um, of exercising per, per exercise, 50 to 60 seconds? Yeah, it depends. It depends on the individual. In other words, um, that amount of resistance is challenging. It's what you might consider heavy-ish. You know. um, some people prefer they don't like the feeling of a very of of being challenged right from the get go. They get a little apprehensive about it or frightened about it, and that's fine. Um, so some clients prefer a lighter weight, so where you're fatiguing more towards the 90 second range. Uh, fatiguing meaning where you aren't capable of lifting the weight again which is what typically is called muscle failure. We like to call it muscular success because failure is a negative word. Um, and by training at that level of intensity, you're ensuring that all of the available muscle fibers, both the slow twitch and the fast twitch, are being gotten to. Because if you don't train to complete fatigue, you may or may not, you just won't know. But if you train to fatigue, you know that you fatigue those fibers. So, do you need to train to failure for benefit? No. But my question always is, how not to failure should you train? <laughs> right? If, if 10 reps is failure, where do you stop? Three? three? Seven? I don't know. But if you try the 11th, then, and you, then you know. Right? Yeah. That doesn't take that much more time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, you're, so, so, you're doing some, so, so, you're making the exercise uh, not just more effective and safer, but much more efficient. And I don't know anybody who doesn't want that. I mean, I know obviously there are people who live in the gym and they just love being in the gym. The gym is their bar or their hobby, and so perhaps this kind of a technique would keep them from that. Yeah. Because with greater effort uh, comes the need for greater recovery. So what about those people who maybe uh, they read bodybuilding magazines and they say, uh, well, you know, I want to get stronger, but I'm more interested in getting bigger. Yeah. So, would there be any difference in the workout that they have to do to get bigger rather than focusing on strength? They want to maybe go five days a week to the gym. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. It's um, 
I can answer it kind of briefly in three parts. One, to be big, like some guys have this thing in their mind, they want to, they just want to be a monster. And let's just assume for now, no one's going to take steroids, okay. right? Because I think pretty much everybody knows by now that any magazine cover or any video you see, if if the you know, and we can get to women. It's, it's the same for women, but it's a little different. Anybody who is that large is taking some sort of steroid. It is extremely rare to have the kinds of genetics that allow you to be that large without taking some sort of anabolic steroid or testosterone or growth hormone or some combination of those things that allow for that kind of size. So I think a lot of people, especially men and boys especially, they have an un, a completely unrealistic view of what's possible. You know, when I played with my G.I. Joe dolls when I was a kid, it was like a normal man. Go buy a G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe doll now. Yeah, they're like monsters. Yeah. That's like steroid monster dolls. Yeah. You know, my Batman doll was skinny. <laughs> yeah? You know? so, so the first thing to understand is that if you want to get jacked like that. It's not going to happen. No matter how you train. No matter what you eat. Gotcha. If, if you, and, and we all know people who, like you got a buddy at the beach, you go to a beach party, and one guy takes off his shirt, and, and you go, dude, what do you do for a workout? And they say, nothing. I don't know. Do you lift weights? Nah. I do push-ups sometimes. And you look at their body, and it looks like they've been working out their whole life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's 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 uh, common, you know, especially back right. in high school in the locker room. Right. They look at the guy and like, what are you doing? Right. Yeah. Not doing anything. And those guys, when they do train, then they become much more muscular and they have an enviable, I guess you could say, enviable physique. But most of us are not born with those oh, yeah, kinds of genetics. We'll say, and we can make good progress with our training, but you have to really be reasonable about that. So, I just, I have to make so if, call. once you kind of so, get that, like, okay, I'm not going to be Arnold, you know, and I'm not going to take steroids because that's just dangerous. Um, how, how do I train to become as muscular as I can? So, um, there is no question that a high level of effort is muscular effort is required. The question then is how much of it you have to do. There does, and so if we want to, if we, if you can get the opinion of the magazines, but of course the magazines tell you something different every other week, right? Yeah. Do more, do less, train fast, train slow, do not, do not. They have a magazine that they have to write every week. They got to fill it with information all the time. So imagine if you wrote a, ma a magazine on physics, and you needed to fill it with new information. Well, if there's no information, there's nothing else to write, right? I mean, force equals mass times acceleration. What more are you going to write about that? Yeah. It's over. <laughs> Isn't there a new way to look at it? No. <laughs> right? So that's true. That's, there's that's, not much, not, not much, it won't be much of a magazine unless there are really truly new scientific discoveries. Yeah. Right? But in, uh, in certain aspects of physical fitness, like a, for example, a biceps, right? Your biceps take your lower arm and flex the elbow. The biceps also flex the shoulder. That's it. That's the main functions of it. So, doing this is going to contract the muscles of the biceps. Okay. There isn't any good evidence to suggest that doing this to fatigue, and then resting, and then doing it again, and then doing it again, and then doing it at this angle, and then doing it again, is going to benefit, is going to benefit you any more than just training, doing that first set to complete fatigue. There are, I don't know how many studies now, 50, 60 or so studies that compare, in many cases, albeit weekly, single sets of the same exercise to multiple sets of the same exercise, and very few, if any, show a superiority to multiple sets for increasing size, for increasing muscular size. For increasing strength, there seems to be a benefit to multiple sets. However, that's only because you're learning more. You're doing it more often. That's why I say it's better for the beginning to come here three times a week. Yeah. You'll get stronger faster because you're 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 just learning how to do it better. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. Um, 
but the actual circumference measurement increases are not benefited by more than a single set of the same exercise. There is benefit, it seems, to multiple sets for the body part, like for your back. Doing one set of pull downs to strengthen your lats and your upper back trapezius and Tomorrow, rhomboids and all that, morning, um, there doesn't seem to be any added benefit. I mean, there seems to be an added benefit to a multiple sets of, for body part, not for the same exercise. Well, okay, so like doing... So you would do like a pullover for your back. You would do a pullover, a pull down, a row, and a shrug. But only one set of each of those. Okay. Right. Muscles don't get the benefit. You get a pump, that feeling of a lot of blood and water and volume in the muscles. But your muscles, that, 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 you're not growing at that moment. You're just pumped up. Okay. You grow when you recover, when the little microscopic tears or lesions or damage, whatever you want to call it, within the muscle knits and repairs yeah. and proliferates, increases the number of the myofibrils, the little mini fibers within the fiber. Gotcha. So, so they thicken and proliferate. And little by little by little over time, the muscle fiber itself gets filled with more myofibrils. Yeah, I know. That's how it gets stronger. That's how it gets stronger and, yeah. and more toned, yeah. denser. Okay. So very often in a beginner, they'll let's say you're bench pressing 100 pounds and now you're bench pressing 170 pounds. Circumference wise, we won't actually measure any difference. But they'll be heavier on scale. Because let's say inside the fiber, there was 10 myofibers. I'm just making up numbers. And now, a month later, or two, uh, no, now instead of 10 myofibrils, there's 100. But the fiber itself hasn't changed its size. So the muscle, if you, if you measure it, it's the same size. It's the same size. But it's denser. So the guy goes from weighing 150 pounds to 160 pounds. But his biceps are the same size. Chest the same size. Thighs the same size. Not until that's filled and expands will you start to see uh, increases in, in circumference. Some people are born with more muscle fibers, more hair on their head, more fat cells, more brain cells, more cells in other people. So if you happen to be born with more muscle fibers to fill with myofibrils, you're going to be bigger, you know, look better. So there's only this. There's pretty much there is no uh, difference in training for size and training for strength. Not really that I'm aware of, except that when you train for strength, see, I want to be clear about it. But and I want to finish my thought about the uh, and for somebody who really wants to train for size, because what we didn't talk about was food. Right. Right. That's going to be one of the most important things. You got to eat. You know, if you if you're not right. Eat, right, if you're not eating adequate protein and getting adequate essential amino acids and amino acids for muscular growth, you train all you like, and you're not going to maximize your muscle muscle size. There's no way. And a lot of people, that's why bodybuilders, people who really bodybuilders who really know what they're doing, are like they're like scientists about their food. Yeah, with the Tupperware carrying it around. Yeah, and all that. they know they they know exactly when they need to, you know, when their protein's metabolized. Now they need to eat more. Sometimes they go overboard with it. Uh, but you definitely need to make sure that you have a handle on your diet, getting in adequate proteins and fats, and minimizing the amount of carbohydrates and sugars that you eat so you don't get fat while you're getting more muscular. Because you don't, you don't want that. So can you go overboard with the protein? You can, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. you can. Um, the easy way to calculate it is that you really don't want to eat more uh, than, and this is what I'm telling you is from, many different experts on the field who have written about it, and they all seem to come to the same agreement, that about two grams of protein per pound of body weight that you are is like pushing the max limit. Okay. Any more than that will probably get converted to, and stored as body fat. Not as readily, though, as excess carbohydrate. Right. You know, but it will get stored as body fat. Um, and so you have to do a little tinkering with your diet. 
So start eating and then train uh, properly. And you should notice a half a pound, quarter pound a week of gain in muscle over the short term. And then obviously that'll slow. You can't okay. keep building, gaining more muscle. When that slows and stops, it depends on your genetics as well. You know. So, um, uh, so is it possible? But, yeah. Go ahead. Is it possible for uh, say someone not to see those gains in weight if they're also losing fat at the same time, body fat? Or is that? Oh well, yeah, yeah. You you definitely if you if you if you if your diet is formulated properly. You can you definitely can lose fat faster than you can gain muscle. Okay. You know, there there are. I don't people know I've ever known anyone who gained muscle <laughs> faster than they could lose their fat. I mean, maybe there's people like that. I mean, there, actually, there probably are somewhere, but I've never. I, I, I think that'd be pretty rare. I mean, yeah, you'd have to have some <laughs> freakish set of genetics to build muscle that quickly. You know? Again, assuming you're eating you're eating properly. Right. But in training for strength or size. If you're training for strength, meaning maximum bench press, maximum squat, um, a lot of the times these guys are doing like one or two reps mm -hmm. and trying to utilize as much body English technique, uh, momentum, you know, body positioning as they can because their goal is just simply lift weight from point A to point B. Yeah. What, now, what a lot, in my opinion, what a lot of and I used to do some Olympic lifting for a very short period of time, um, very short. Um, but when I was talking to these guys, you know, um, they don't seem to get that. If they trained to build more muscle, they'd have more strength. <laughs> the, the, yeah, I would even say things as simple as, well, you know, if I took my magic wand of muscle. So let's say your, your best uh, clean and jerk is... Uh, 100 kilograms. If I took my magic wand of strength and tapped you, right, and I put 25 pounds more muscle on your shoulders and arms, you don't think you'd lift more weight? Bar, isn't what they're doing you, helping you, them lift weight? What's that? It, um, they're, they're, uh, the way they train? The way they train. Oh, yeah, no. You have to train the way they train in order to lift weights that way, right? So you got to get a good coach, you got to get somebody who really knows what they're doing when it comes to Olympic lifting, listen to what they say, and practice. But you, and, and because you're, you're lifting weights, right, you're yeah. going to get stronger. Right. You're going to gain muscle lifting like that. But it's, it's haphazard, you know, it's not, there should be a day a week where you're focused on building muscle. Gotcha. Which is going to aid you in that strength endeavor, you know. Yeah. And obviously there will come a point where you can't really build much more muscle. And so it's possible that somebody who's been Olympic lifting for 10 years managed to build the most amount of muscle he's going to build in that 10 years. But he could have built it much faster. If he has taken one day out of the week just to focus completely on the on, strength. On building muscle. And not technique. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, people, I think you know, and we, we may be straying from the question a little bit, but I think the people who are into that kind of a sport, uh, they way overtrain at their sport mm -hmm. and way undertrain in uh, their, uh, to build muscle. Which is equally as important, if not. Right. And it isn't, right, right. And, and it isn't sufficient to say, oh yeah, Fred, well, I mean, look at these guys, you know, they don't do what you do, they do what they do, and look how strong they are. It's like, they are that strong despite what they do. There's always going to be a guy, if, you know, if, if 20, 30,000 people want to go do that, there's going to be five people that come out who are the best, but they'd have been the best anyway. Right, It right. wasn't because that's the way they trained. I mean, Michael Jordan didn't, wasn't, isn't Michael Jordan because he played basketball more. Right, right. He probably didn't. He didn't have to. You know? He had to make for it. Right. Yeah, and that, he, that, he stood out and, and that's on built on his way, you know? Yeah. Makes, that makes perfect sense. Right, and it's, just, and it's the same thing with powerlifting. It's the same thing with Olympic lifting. It's the same thing with judo karate. It's the same thing. 
It's a skill set. Right, and yes, you have to practice the skill, yeah. clearly. And that's, there's a great book called Why Michael Couldn't Hit uh, by Dr. I forget the first name, Clowans. And he discusses, you know, okay, so Michael Jordan was arguably one of, if not the greatest basketball player who ever lived, right? Yeah. And then he thought he was such a great athlete, he tried professional baseball. Because yeah. the ball saves life. Because he never practiced it. You know, so it doesn't yeah. make any difference. It's not going to transfer to the other. Yeah. So, when people talk about... Um... So, 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 not to cut you off, but <laughs> so the point of that is, yes, there are 14-year-old boys that can snatch more weight than me. They're not stronger than me. They're lifting more weight than me, but they're so skilled at that technique that they can use that technique to put more weight from the ground over their head. Or as if they just stood there and tried to lift it up slowly, they wouldn't If be they able tried to, to use the weights that I use in the gym, they wouldn't be able to budge them. And, I don't know, it sounds weird, but if we got on the ground and wrestled, they would lose. <laughs> you know? So, a lot of people don't, for whatever reason, they don't make that distinction between strength and skill set strength. You know, that, that, that kid who can snatch more weight than I can, he's not going to beat me in an arm wrestle. Right. He won't even move me. <laughs> right. But yet he can hoist more weight over his head because his technique is so good. Because he's practicing, 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 practicing. So he's, he's basically learning how to maneuver the weight rather than, you know, strong arm it. That's right. That's right. And that's why... Uh, and Arthur Jones had said this, the guy who invented Nautilus years ago, you can't, you can't measure strength dynamically, like how much weight you can toss over your head. You can only really measure strength statically. So if you wanted to measure the strengths of the biceps, you would contract against the resistance and not be able to move it and watch a strain gauge increase. So as I pulled it, you'd see the gauge go up, up, and up, and up. Oh, wow. So there's no ability for me to go <clears throat> and yank it and produce a, uh, an impact force. That's not really your strength. Yeah. Now, partly, yes, but also, let's say another person is just too afraid to hurt themselves, and they go, <clears throat> right, I right. don't want to hurt. Yeah. Or somebody else is just totally half cocky, I don't give a crap yank at it, you know, oh, that person's strong, that person's see, Well, no, you know, not necessarily so. Uh, so, um, but that same person with, uh, with a larger muscle is good, that if the muscle's larger, it must be stronger. Okay. So you can't have, sometimes people look at people that have, uh, you know, big muscles and they'll say, yeah, it's all for show, they're not really strong. Yeah. Yes, they are. <laughs> Yes, they are. It's as simple as that. They're, they're yes, they big muscles equals strong. Yeah, yeah, and I always like to compare the person to the person. There are people with big muscles who might actually not be as strong as, meaning be able to produce as much force as a smaller person because other factors like where the ligaments attach on the arm also can contribute to the ability to produce torque or force okay. to a greater extent, that and limb length, and there are other things. But, but if I, like, if I tap, if I tested your strength now and then tapped you, and you were 15 pounds of muscle heavier, you would be stronger with the 15 pounds more muscle than the you with the less 15 pounds of muscle. Absolutely, there's no other way around it. Because muscles are just force-producing entities. That's what they are. So, what about, uh, have you ever had people come up to you and say, well, you know, um, you know, big muscles are nice, but I want to be athletic. I want to train to be, you know, flexible and jump high and, you know, right. um, break records. <laughs> now, would there be any How different training, say more? sprinting or jump roping? Well, you'd have to practice. I'd say, okay, so what, what is it that you want to do? So, say, okay, I want to be the greatest sprinter. Okay, well, find yourself, like, the greatest sprinting coach you can find. Hire them and practice and do exactly what he says. Then, 
train to build as much muscle on your legs as you can. Because the more muscle there is on your legs, I mean, like, let's say you want your car to go faster. You're not going to change, you're going to take the engine out, and you're going to put a more powerful engine in. You say, you know, because a lot of people will say, well, yeah, but let's say you make his leg muscles each 10 pounds more muscle larger, they're going to be heavier than he's going to be slower. Yeah. Uh, so if I take the four cylinder engine out of my car that weighs 500 pounds and put an eight cylinder engine in my car that weighs 1500 pounds, my car's going to go slower? <laughs> no, because the end, because that's the thing that produces the, 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 the force, the energy, the power. Right, right. So it's not like you're adding 10 pounds of muscle to your thigh and it's dead weight. It's not like you're hanging 10 pounds of fat. Yes, you'd be slower. Okay. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. it can't, fat is just hanging on there. It's, there's, there's no contracti contractibility to fat. It doesn't contribute to force production. Now, if I took that sprinter and didn't make his legs any more muscular, but put 10 or 15 pounds of muscle on his upper body, then yeah, I might make him slower. So, or the Tour de France, guy who wants to win the Tour de France, say, might not be smart to put bulk on his upper body, mm -hmm. right? Or a rock climber. I don't know. You'd have to, you'd have to think it through. So there are sports where, yeah, it's possible that by adding too much muscle here or there, it could hinder their ability to perform best at their sport. Gotcha. But again, so... Uh, it, you would have to be really, really rare. It, it would have to be rare. You'd have to have a rare set of genetics to be able to build so much muscle that you would actually hinder your ability to do something. And I, don't, I don't see it. I remember once when I was a kid, I was watching uh, like one of those World's Strongest Man contests. But way back then, in the '70s, in the wide world of sports, they had um, bodybuilders competing with like professional football players, oh, wow. and it was different than it is today. Yeah. And so one of the competitors was Lou Ferrigno, and he got on the bicycle, right? So Lou Ferrigno was, what, 6'4", 280 pounds of muscle, right? Yeah. And they had these other guys, like Bruce Jenner, I think he was competing in that one, you know, the guy who won the, uh, uh, the decathlon uh, back in the 70-something Olympics or whatever it was. And other, like, professional athletes that you would think... Well, you know, Lou's big and strong. He'll probably win the weightlifting contest, but these guys are going to blow him away in the, in the yeah. bicycle because he's too big. He's too heavy. You know, he can't. Yeah. So they, so they blow the whistle and they start, and so you see this giant guy <laughs> on this bike, right? And he's starting to pedal and he's going, and he's going like, like, wow, flying. No one's even like near him. He's just, going, and, he, and then all of a sudden the pedals break. And the handlebars snap, and the whole bicycle, because he just, the bicycle couldn't take the power that he was, he was, that he putting, was putting into it. Wow. And it like all fell apart, and he fell off the bike, and he skinned his old leg up and the whole thing. And, and he was, turned green. It was a wreck. Like yeah, right. <laughs> but you know what I mean? So, yeah. so no. So, in, I know a lot of people will say, well, no, too much muscle is going to slow the athlete down. I, I guess it's possible in some things, but I, I, don't, think, I don't think so in, in most cases, and I think the opposite. Is true. Yeah. So generally, it's, it's not practical to say, I'm going to put on muscles that's going to hinder me from my sport. Right. So how about people that say, well, you know what, um, yes, I want to be stronger, but, you know, I get tired because I want more stamina. You know, I want to jog, mm -hmm. you know, I want, I want to be able to have, a, you know, my cardiovascular system really, in, uh, you know, on yeah. par with my strength. Yeah. How, how would they go about that? Well, the cardiovascular system, so say, you know, which includes your, your, your lungs, your heart, um, and all of the veins and arteries that oh are going throughout your body, oh are in a sense subservient to, controlled by, go along for the ride with your muscles, which contain all the mitochondria, which are the energy producing Pac-Men, so to speak, powerhouses within, within the muscles which produce ATP and energy and um, when you want, when someone says they want more endurance, they want more stamina, they want more wind, yeah. right, what they're really saying about knowing it is they want more mitochondria in their muscles. Hmm. 
So more the more you have of those, and the more the greater your skill at the thing you're doing, right? Because it always comes down to that too. If you want to be a good runner, you got to run. Right. You got to learn how to run. Learn your stride. Right. I mean, there are certainly ways to run that are wrong. That's true. That are going to mess up your knees and all. so. So, get, you know, forgetting all of that, that all is part of it, but forgetting all of that, what what the person who's into endurance and stamina wants is more mitochondria within the muscles. So, resistance training, making your muscles stronger, proliferates, increases the total number of mitochondria within the muscles, significantly. Um, added, at the same time, hypertrophies the muscle fibers, so you have more muscle fibers, more muscle fibers you have, more mitochondria you can have. Um, running alone proliferates mitochondria, but it doesn't cause hypertrophy. So many studies show that, and the researchers kind of misconclude their own research on it, but they will show that they'll, they'll look at a plug of muscle under the microscope yeah. before and after, and they'll see that when people strength train, they decrease their mitochondrial density. And they assume that means it's going to wreck your endurance. Oh, okay. But, if you have a hundred cars on one road, and you look at that road from like a, with a telescope, and you'll see a whole bunch of cars all stuck right here. If you double the roads, but triple the amount of cars, but you look at that same spot, it's going to look like there's less cars. Right, right. But there's actually more total cars because now you have a bigger highway. So that's the problem with looking at just a muscle plug and seeing what the, what the researchers aren't seeing. It's like the Hubble spaceship, right? You, know, you look out that when you see all these galaxies out here. Yeah. Right? What about up down here? <laughs> what about over here? What about over there? There's a lot more galaxies than just there. Right. So if you think about it that way, it's a, it's, it's a mistake to think that mitochondria, a decrease in mitochondrial density means a decrease in total mitochondria. No. So they conclude in, incorrectly that uh, strength training may be detrimental to uh, endurance performance. Because they, so, they didn't. In fact, one of the studies that we used to research, Dr. Eads and I used to research for research for the Slogan Fitness Revolution book, yeah. was a study that showed that um, uh, that strength training actually increased it was eight weeks. I forget, sixteen weeks maybe. Uh, it, uh, increased total mitochondria by forty-four percent. Wow! Even though the, the researchers concluded that it decreased mitochondria. And it, it did decrease mitochondrial density, but so what? That only through that criteria does it... So, so it's not untrue, uh -huh. but it doesn't make any difference. Gotcha. Because the total mitochondria improved by 44%. It's like twofold. Wow. So would you say that a so long-distance runner would benefit? Absolutely. From absolutely benefit from strength training. Yeah. There isn't... I can't think of an athlete that wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But yes, it would definitely improve his endurance. Uh, obviously be able to improve his short-term sprint speed okay. as well. So if he needs that last bit of oomph at the end. Uh, but I think a lot of runners, especially endurance athletes, they believe what they've heard from well-meaning exercise physiologists and other folks that say, well, no, 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 because you know, if you, if you do too much weightlifting with your legs, it's going gonna, it's gonna to decrease your mitochondrial density, and that's not going to be good. Oh, a little strength training is okay, but you don't want to build too much muscle because of that one. That's, they're really short-changing. I mean, they don't... They, they don't trying to hurt them on purpose, but they're mm -hmm. innocently ignorant about that fact. Okay. So they shortchange the, the, the endurance athlete by limiting their strength uh, training. So even swimmers would benefit from strength training? Yeah, in fact we have a doctor here who is a uh, master's swimmer and he has benefited uh, greatly from the, the strengthening program. Breaking his own records and being able to keep up with people who are younger than him. And, you know, yeah. So do you have a lot of old people that come here? Is there any um, dangers to uh, older uh, people, you know, doing, uh, you know, doing exercise to fatigue? The um, old or young, the only danger to doing this or many other exercises is if there is known cardiovascular 
disease. Okay. Um, it is hard work. And you are asking your heart to pump more blood. You are contracting strongly against resistance. And while we are very, very, um, what's the right word, cognizant of, of, of uh, uh, blood pressure and people holding their breath and things of this nature that can increase blood pressure, you know, people still do it. Okay. You, know, it's, you, you can't always, nobody's like this perfect trainee. I mean, you know, we, yeah. I do it, we all do it. Um, so if you have known coronary artery disease, we don't, you know, we're not a hospital, I'm not a doctor, we don't have a crash cart here. Mm -hmm. God forbid if something was to happen, like if a 87 year old man had, uh, let's say two years before, had a ruptured aorta okay. near his stomach or near his heart, you know, just because he's old, um, and the doctor saved him in time and fixed him, yeah, I don't know, it would be such a great idea to, to to work so strenuously if you've already had an event. Okay. So in the case where we've had people like that, we just don't push them that hard. Okay. But you still can get benefit from resistance training without going balls to the wall. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? But other than that, there is really isn't a single... I mean, I wouldn't strength train people who have disease like cancer. It's just too, it's too demanding on their... Their body's already trying to fight right yeah the cancer and if they're taking chemotherapy or doing it's, it's, too, it's too much it's too much once they're well got you know hopefully then they should definitely uh, engage in the strength training program to get the strength back and to and obviously to eat healthy so as long as you have a healthy adult uh, a healthy senior. older senior yeah, yeah. no it's, it's 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 probably the single best exercise it is the single best exercise they can engage in you know Take a walk in the park and all that stuff. Ride your bike with your loved one. Fine, 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 fine. fine. But you're going to walk better and ride your bike better okay. if you strength train uh, once or twice a week for 15 minutes. And uh, and a lot of seniors, I think, are unfortunately shortchanged because when they ask their doctor, the doctors walk. Yeah, because he can't get in trouble if he <laughs> for that. But if he yeah. says go lift weights and something happens, oh okay. You know, technically, I th I'm pretty sure about this. They they. If a doctor prescribes anything other than an activity of daily living, it's possible that they could be held liable wow. for the recommendation. That's why, although we know now that statins do not help anyone, yeah. except a very tiny fraction of men who have already had an event, mm -hmm. um, doesn't help women at all, um, if you have high cholesterol and you're a doctor and you don't say take a statin because it's become the standard of care, unfortunately. Yeah. If you don't say take a statin and you have a heart attack, they can be held liable. All right. So um, that's why, unfortunately, I think a lot of doctors don't tell their seniors go lift weights, Mary. You know. Yeah. It'll help you walk. It'll help you stand up out of the chair. It'll let you travel. It'll give you your life back. It's like it is the fountain of youth, so, along with eating healthfully. Okay. You know, I used to not years and years ago. Like when I first opened up this gym. Yeah. I didn't really realize the role the diet played as well as I do now. I knew it was important, but but I've even had people when we do initial consultations with clients. Yeah. I've even had clients that I've sat down and I've said, you know, blah, 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 training. Okay, now, you need to eat in a manner that allows you to get all of your essential fatty acids, your essential amino acids, and this is how you're going to need to eat. And they won't, and like, well, Fred, look, I don't eat breakfast. I have a cup of coffee and a bagel. I eat pizza every day for lunch, and I don't like meat, and I'm just not going to eat it. I'm going to have my peanut butter and jelly sandwich at night. I've told people to go. <laughs> Seriously. Is it that serious? Yeah. Because you're going to go in the, you're going to give me your money. Yeah. You're going to go in the gym. You're not going to have any energy. I'm going to break down your muscle tissue, and it's going to stay there. How are you going to rebuild it? With peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? <laughs> yeah. With bagel. So Second there's not hand. enough protein in the peanut butter. No, not even close. I mean, first of all, it's not a complete protein. In nuts, nuts don't have complete proteins. So. You would have to eat, I don't know how much of it you'd have to eat. You, you couldn't eat enough of it. Wow. 
you know, plus the fact that the, the, the ant, because peanuts are nuts, mm -hmm. this is a whole other story, but there are the anti-nutrients in the nuts, the lectin proteins are, most people don't realize that the, peop, that the health foods that they're brainwashing and believing are health foods are really death foods, Whoa. or unhealth foods. Um, death is probably a strong word, but um, they contain a lot, like, like for example, there are mushrooms that if you eat them, you're dead. Yeah. So think of that as the ultimate anti-nutrient. It kills you. Yeah. So you're oog, I'm og. You know, you were 200,000 years ago. Oog eats the mushroom, oog dies. Og says, okay, we ain't eating those things. <laughs> right? Yeah. But a lot of people don't, but like smokers, when they smoke, they don't see the damage you're doing to their lungs. If your lungs were out here, yeah, most people wouldn't smoke. Because you could literally see what right, the right. damage you were doing. It's out of sight, out of mind, right? So... <clears throat> Lesser anti-nutrients exist in many, if not not all, but most grain foods, grain-based foods and legumes. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Lauren Cordain writes about this uh, extensively. Um, he has a paper titled, Cereal Grains, Humanity's Double-Edged Sword. And he lists in it an, an enormous amount of anti-nutrients in many of the common foods we think of as healthy. Dr. Bill Davis, who wrote the New York Times bestseller Wheat Belly, he's a friend of mine, I've lectured with him. Uh, he wasn't on the low-carb cruise last year, but yeah. he uh, talks extensively about how wheat is just... You know, people think saturated fat's bad for you. Yeah. It, take saturated fat and replace it with wheat. That's what's bad for you. The saturated fat's really healthful. You know. So, um... But again, that's that that uh, that's a whole other whole other aspect of of the talk that I could give. But um, that client who is uh, who refuses to eat healthfully isn't going to get much benefit from exercise. So the, the the two have to go hand in hand. Okay. Very important. We stress that to our clients as much as we can. So how much protein do they have to eat? And is there a time frame after they work out? that's good for protein synthesis? Seems to be, yeah. Um, they need to eat at least a gram per pound of body weight. So if you if the person weighs 150 pounds, they want to get 150 grams. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 0.5 okay. grams per pound of body weight. So they need at least 75 grams of protein. You know, they want to be eating more in the neighborhood of, because they want to build a little muscle. You don't have to eat that much more. Mm -hmm. But you want to eat more, and that person would want to eat more in the neighborhood of 80 grams, okay. 85, in, in, in that range. Um, and, um, um, you know, depending on the size of the person, of course, so that, that's mm -hmm. going to matter. Um, you know, how much muscle they can build. So you have to start at a certain place, and then you, and you kind of tweak it from there, you know. Um, I'm forgetting now about the other part of it. Um, how, how soon after oh, how soon after, right. Yeah. Well, there seems to be good evidence to suggest that right away. That soon there's about an hour window. Okay. So you kind of want to get in a, depending on your size, but it seems to be more in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 grams of protein. So you go in the gym, you do a high-intensity strength exercise session for 15, 20, 30 minutes, come out of the gym, and relatively within an hour have a meal or a, or a protein replacement drink. Okay. Um, well, I used to know this by heart. There were several studies. One compared groups of men who... Uh, so there were three groups of men. One group ate a protein-rich meal before they exercised, exercised, and then right after. The other group ate nothing before and nothing after. The other group just ate after. The group that ate the protein before and after got the best results. The group that ate the protein after got pretty close to the best results. And the group that didn't eat any got much worse results. In fact, the group that ate the protein before and after and just after gained twice the amount of muscle that the group who than the group that didn't take anything in within that hour. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I used to remember the name of the the authors and the whole thing where it was done. I don't know. If, I don't remember now, but. Uh, that's part of what got me realizing, wow, this is a pretty well done study. This is more important than I realized. And then I, and, and then when I adopted a, uh, a high fat, adequate protein, low sugar diet, 
where most of my carbohydrates, if not all my carbohydrates, came from plants, um, I started to notice, even as an older guy, I started to notice a definite improvement in my my physique. I was I was less soft looking. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. So can so. can is there an age where muscle building plateaus, or can people always build more muscle fibers? You can always build, assuming you're eating well. You can always build. You know there are there are some good research studies on 90 year olds. Wow. Um, or I guess it was octogenarians and 90 year olds that after six weeks of training, the doctor when they did a little cutaway slide of muscle yeah. uh, from a, like an MRI image and they showed a doctor the muscle, I think it was the femur, it might have been the humerus, but mm -hmm. uh, that just like a cross-sectional area from an MRI image and they showed the doctor, the expert, and they said to the doctor, okay, which one's the 35 year old and which one's the 85 year old? Couldn't tell the difference. Really? Yeah. Obviously on the outside. Yeah. You know, it's not going to turn your hair <laughs> back to the color it was, or grow hair in, or make your skin unwrinkled. Yeah. But from within, um, you they these men and women. No, I think it was just men in the study. Literally de-aged themselves, wow. and you know, uh, on a muscular uh, level. And there was a, a recent study from it was either Switzerland or Sweden that happened to measure not just muscle mass and fat mass and um, other blood markers, but they actually measured some genetic markers of aging, some 800, 850 different genetic biomarkers of aging, and apparently somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three hundred of those biomarkers reversed to levels that are generally seen in 20 and 30 year olds. So resistance training even, even de-ages you on a genetic level, something not seen in aerobic aerobic training. And I think I, I, my, my speculation is is that when you're asking your body to build, yeah. it has to upregulate everything. Everything, right. To, to do that. And as you get older, obviously, it can't upregulate everything because there's no such thing as immortality, right? No matter what you do. But, yeah. but I think that um, uh, you know, I, can't, I can't even imagine how much less health care would cost us if every single senior who was capable of it, like who already didn't have like, you know, a disease that they're not going to recover from or something, yeah. like that, <clears throat> was told by their doctors, lift weights once a week, 15 minutes, you know, it's all, it's obey me the way you obey me when I tell you to take this pill. Yeah. Obey me when I tell you to do that. It would be incredible. It really is a fountain of youth, huh? Yeah. I think how many families would be underburdened by having to take care of the mom who can't get out of a chair. Yeah. Now mom can get out of a chair. Now mom can walk down the stairs. Wow. You know, just you know, it's like if you if you if you just stop for a second and think about the far-reaching benefits of that. Yeah. You know. It's, it's incredible. But, 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 right. It's incredible. Isn't it? But unfortunately, people think the little bubble that comes out of their mind when they think weightlifting is Arnold. Yeah. That's it. Oh, that's just for building muscles. That's that's for big biceps. I don't I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that. No, I, I don't need your weight. I don't I don't need your weight stuff, Fred. I play tennis three times a week. Because what they're really saying is I don't want man size muscles, and most men don't want those kinds of muscles either. Right. Right. Yeah. So unfortunately, when bodybuilding. Bodybuilding got popular, like in the same way saturated fats and low-fat diets got popularized. Now everybody believes that low-fat diets are healthy, even though so much evidence is coming out to show that it's wrong, 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 wrong. Yeah. That the obesity epidemic actually started and has continued to grow five or I think five or ten years after we bought the whole low-fat, no-fat, high-carbohydrate song and dance hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. But, um, like Mark Twain said, you know, the truth is easy to kill, but a lie well told is immortal. Uh, that stands true. So it's unfortunate. So people think of weightlifting as just something that makes you big and tight and bulky. I don't want that. Like people say, Fred, you know, my clients here say, why don't you have a line, like, around the block of people who want to come in and train with you? It's because of that. 
It's like no matter what I say on my web blog, no matter what I say on my website, no matter what I say in my brochure, you know, it, it, it doesn't get in. It doesn't get in because lifting weight means tight, bulky, ugly. So they already have that association ingrained for so long yeah. that they can't break away from it. Right. Like Pilates, women have been brainwashed into believing that Pilates gives you long, lean dancer muscles. So a lot of these women, they think, I'm going I'm to start Pilates. I'm going to do it today. What, what are they really saying? I'm going to go have a body like those dancers. <laughs> right, right. That's what they're saying. Yeah. Right. They they're not going to that. get that. And even, even uh, what's her name? Mari Windsor of Windsor Pilates. She had a whole Guthy Ranker infomercial. And her, um, ho uh, not host, whatever, the woman who was hosting it. Mm -hmm. I forget what her name was. You know, you know, pretty attractive model, actress, said, she goes, haven't you always wanted those long, lean muscles of a dancer? Now you can have them with Marty <laughs> Windsor Pilates. Just a flat out lie. Wow. And then sold millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of product. So you like, see the whole lie, 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 lie. Right. Yoga's the same way. There's a mystique about these things that have uh, been ingrained in people's minds. I'm not saying anything bad about yoga. Yeah. I'm not saying bad about yeah. Pilates. I'm just talking about the, the marketing of it. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, they give it like this spiritual aura where it's, you know, it's like right. it's a humble, you know, nice thing right. you can do and it'll, it'll help you from the inside. Right, like being a vegan. Yeah. I'm going to save the earth. Actually, you're going you're gonna to destroy it. Yeah, let's just level all the topsoil that the planet has. And you know how many, how many animals are displaced, how many species of animals are displaced and killed and wiped out, rendered extinct? Buy soybean fields, and wheat fields, and corn fields. Oops. Yeah, just stop to think about that one. You know? so it's all about how but it makes them feel. Right, it's all about how, they, how it makes them feel. Yeah. Right. So, no one yet, and I have also failed, no one yet has been able to uh, turn the horse around and ride it in the opposite direction to get people to understand that resistance training, weightlifting specifically, is the fountain of youth. Yeah. I've been trying. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, believe me, I've been reading, I've been up to date with your blog and, you know, it's information after information, it's great stuff, but like you said, you know, it's about how it makes them feel. Right. Um, right. So going back to the diet, Yeah. Um, now you got a lot of people that they, you know, they go, they eat higher fat, and they eat moderate protein, and you know, chances are they're gonna get into ketosis that way. Um, now, is there any uh, anybody that comes in here that is training in ketosis that shows less performance than they would in glycosis? Well, I would like to say I wish that my clients were so. Um, I have to choose the right word. I don't like the word obedient. Uh, compliant? That'll work. That they did eat the way I suggest and were actually able to put themselves into a state of nutritional ketosis for a short period. Of, well, it's not dangerous for any length of time, but they don't need to be in nutritional ketosis forever. Gotcha. But it is a good way to jumpstart your fat loss okay. and get you to really learn how to, how to eat healthfully and how to feel better very quickly. Does it hit your performance though in the gym? Well, that's the thing. Uh, I'm trying to be honest and say that I, I don't know because I don't really know that any of my clients, okay, are doing that. I do, and many of friends that I know do, and it doesn't at all. And here's the reason why: because our exercise bouts are short and sweet. Okay. So we're not going to burn through all of our muscle glycogen. So, um, and then we rest, right? So that if I train on a Monday, I don't train again until Wednesday, Thursday, Friday sometimes. So I'm, I'm replenishing it as I go just from gluconeogenesis. Oh, okay. So the, the problem with that, that a lot of the experts, uh, you know, say, mention like Steve Finney and uh, 
Although I think Dr. Jeff Volick is actually thinking differently, but I don't know exactly, but uh, that allowing for glycogen replenishment via gluconeogenesis is very slow and sluggish. So if you wanted to be a professional, let's say you were a, a, an Olympic sprinter, yeah. and you were in the throes of your training, and you were being trained by your coach, and or being overtrained by your coach, doing way more than you need to do, uh, it's doubtful that you'd be able to rely upon stored body fat as your main source of fuel, okay. and you'd probably suffer. Oh, okay. Or if you're into mixed martial arts, right, and you were training every day, yeah. your performance would probably suffer. Gotcha. You know, but if you were doing marathon training and endurance cycle, like endurance training, where you're not burning through your muscle glycogen anywhere near to the same degree, there seems to be good evidence to suggest that training in nutritional ketosis, there's no difference in your performance, whether you train in nutritional ketosis or if you're relying on constantly ingesting carbohydrate to replenish your glycogen stores. Gotcha. So if you're fully fat adapted by being in nutritional ketosis or not fully fat adapted at all and just really sugar adapted, I guess you could say, um, either one will get you to your goal. And uh, I forget the guy's name, he just recently won the 100 mile run. He was a low carb. Oh yeah? And he won by 15 minutes or something like that. Wow. So maybe there's some evidence to suggest, and that might have been like an N equals 1 situation where it was just him, it might not be anybody else, but right, I don't know. Right, right. But maybe it's possible that if you are that way long enough, you'll fat adapt so well that you actually would uh, surpass what you what you did before, what your performance was before. So. so, is there is there any evidence to suggest that an uh, insulin spike after exercise helps with uh, with muscle growth? A lot of people say you know load yeah. up you know on fast digesting carbs afterwards to help you know transport the protein. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I I don't think there's any need for that. Um, you know, by replacing. I mean, if you're having such an intense workout that you're really, really using a tremendous amount of muscle glycogen, like if you're doing an hour and a half in the gym, which yeah. is just, there's no need for that. But if, if you're doing that, I would guess that the replenishment of the glycogen via like a sweet potato mm -hmm. or something in your drink would help. Gotcha. But... Do you personally uh, uh, load up on carbs after exercising? Yeah. I don't. I don't ever load up on carbs ever. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, my typical meals are, you know, like a Florentine omelet in the morning, like spinach and mushrooms and cheese and bacon and three eggs with some hollandaise sauce on it, uh, and then lunch might be. So let's say I have sashimi and a salad, okay. and then dinner I'll have a salad and steak. You know. Uh, every once in a while I'll eat some squash, sweet potato, for the vitamins in it and stuff like that. But not not a whole lot. And um, my circumference measurements, my arms, my chest, my are the same now than when the bigger actually now than ten years ago when I wasn't eating lo low carb. So you said I was eating pasta and rice and so it wasn't like then I was like <laughs> yeah. muscular and then I went to a low carb diet and I turned and I shriveled into a skinny sinewy muscular guy. Which is what a lot of people think, right? I mean, yeah. I, I get that because I personally I train in, uh, in, in nutritional ketosis as well and yeah. a lot of people would say, well you're not going to build any muscle that way because you simply need, you need the sugar to transport the protein to your muscles. That's how I'm aware. And the, uh, it's not like I have no carbohydrates. You don't, you can be in nutritional ketosis eating 60 grams of carbohydrates a day. Right. I mean, how much sugar do you need? Really? So that, that would be the question. So if you're getting, if you're monitoring your progress in the gym and your form is good and you're carefully monitoring, you know, how much weight you're doing each time, if you're getting stronger and stronger and stronger, and you see that you're getting leaner, um, it's working. And you're doing it in a way that's much healthier 
than if you were to do it by eating a giant bowl of po chicken pasta. You know, yeah. so if there is any truth to the requirement for carbohydrate after your workout, I don't think it requires that much. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Is there any benefit to uh, being in nutritional ketosis for, in the long term? Well, I think if you're metabolically, I think if you have, uh, I think uh, there's some good evidence to suggest that if you are highly insulin resistant, you're insulin resistant, or you're type two diabetic. Um, or type 1 diabetic, um, that might be the best state for you to be in permanently. You know, but for the average person, not, not so much? I don't think it's necessary. Uh, but again, you, know, you can be in nutritional ketosis eating you know, some, a piece of melon in the morning and having a salad at lunch and having a salad at dinner. You know? it's, it's, uh, if you're eating natural, it's not so hard to stay in. Yeah. Yeah. Once you eat that bowl of pasta and have that bagel in the morning, yeah, you're going to bump yourself out. Yeah. You know, I think, I think also if you, uh, who was it who said it? It was, I don't know if it was Dr. Bullock or if you drink too much alcohol, like if you're young and you're partying every night, you're going out mm -hmm. up to work and I'm married and you have kids and you're going out to the bar and you're pounding the beers down and yeah, you're going to, you're going to, even if you eat right the whole day and then you drink two, three beers, you know, you're done. You're out. Yeah. So, you know. So, what do you think of when you hear somebody say functional training or stabilizing muscles? Yeah. I know those those words, you know, you don't like those words. Yeah, well, they don't really mean much, but... Uh, so, functional training, of course, that presupposes that um, you're, you need to train in a functional manner in order to be functional. Well, what's function? So we've got to define those terms. Right. What's the function of my biceps? We kind of went over that before. Yeah. The function of my biceps is not to throw a football. <laughs> right? Right, right? That would really be your triceps. The function of my biceps is to flex the elbow and to flex the shoulder. The function of my triceps to is extend my elbow and extend my shoulder. That's what those muscles do. When I combine the use of many muscles, then I produce, let's say, playing soccer, I produce a function called playing soccer. Right. But I'm still, when I kick a soccer ball, yeah. extending my knee. Right, right. Extending my hip. The muscles that extend the knee and extend the hip want to be as strong as possible. No? As weak as possible? <laughs> Definitely not, right? The same strength? There's only three choices, right? Your muscles kind of be A, weaker, B, the same strength, or C, stronger. So, do you want your leg muscles to be A, weaker, <laughs> B, the same strength, or C, stronger if you play soccer? <laughs> I think I know. So, you need to train those muscles in their function to then become more functional in whatever the hell you want to do. That's what these functional trainers don't get. So get taking the weight on one of those things that move all around and going like, like <laughs> Who says that's functional? Like even 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 following their own logic. Yeah. When do I ever do that in real life? <laughs> you know? Because that's what they say, right? Well machines, you don't you don't ever do you don't ever do this in real life. Like, well, well, actually, I do, but but I get what you're trying to say. Yeah. But, so then you put me on a on a balance beam, right? And have me doing it. When the hell do I ever do that in real life? Let me see you do that. You know? That's true. It's it's silly. Yeah. Um, it's it's again good marketing. Unfortunately, for many well-meaning trainers who are going to wind up hurting their clients mm -hmm. doing things like that. Um, now, stabilizing muscles. It is true that there are muscles that all muscles stabilize. Okay. Right? Don't they? Yeah. They all do. So every single muscle in your body is a stabilizing muscle. But there are smaller muscles that attach like vertebrae to vertebrae. Take care. Uh, 
like the popliteal muscle right in the back of the knee. It's a tiny little muscle that crosses the knee joint, and it's responsible for the first like inch of flexion. There are smaller muscles that aren't designed to handle the load of the larger muscles. That's why squatting with a barbell is such a bad idea, because you're putting the entire weight and a weight that your hips are fully capable of contracting against on top of your cervical spine. Not smart. You know, and I don't care that there are thousands of people who, who do squats and they don't have any neck pain. It, that's beside the point. You know, lots of people, many people who smoke cigarettes, they never get cancer, they never get lung disease, they never get emphysema. That's true. It's still bad. Right, right. Okay. So, um, so you do have to be careful what you're doing. Uh, if you do certain exercises that might load parts of the muscle that aren't really um, capable of handling the weight that the larger muscles are, are capable of. For example, when we do knee flexion with people to strengthen the hamstrings, we never let people start with a knee that's completely straight. Okay. Because that's going to ask the popliteal to do the first inch. So we start, so we're doing that exercise. So let's say this is your knee joint. Okay. We start the exercise here. Okay. Now that muscle is already slack. Gotcha. So then when you contract against it, the larger muscle, that guy's already, he's out of the picture already. Okay. So, you know, now how do you know these things? Well, we're experienced professional instructors. We read our Gray's Anatomy. Um, and um, uh, we do our very best to make sure that we're bypassing those areas so that we're loading the muscle, the joints and the muscle properly. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, what about, um, do you guys ever use free weights at all in there or is it just machines? And well, it's, it's mainly machines. We do have a few free weight exercises that we do. Um, but the, again, your, your biceps cannot know that there's a Nautilus machine here a dumbbell here, a rock here, it's just going to contract and uncontract. So there is no truth to the fact that a free weight is superior to a machine or that a machine is superior to a free weight necessarily. Yeah. You know. So uh, as a personal training center, uh, our instructors will train 15 people sometimes a day. And if they have to lift them up, yeah, it really wouldn't be a very efficient way to run a personal training. Since since the benefit to the muscle is no different, yeah. and in many cases you can design a machine to be better than a free weight. Um, if you have really crummy machines, like when I used to work at some gyms, sometimes I would use free weights instead of machines. The machines are so bad that I would, I would use free weights instead. So uh, I'm not married to any one particular thing. But like for example, there's no real way to train your lower back or your neck efficiently or effectively or safely without a machine. You just can't do it with free weights. There's certain things you can do, certain things you can't do. So would you say that, um, again going back to the, to the stabilizing muscles, well, you know, you have some people, you know, they'll squat and they'll be like, well yeah, I like that better than a, than a the leg press because you do not have to balance the bar. Now I'm working those muscles out. Yeah, that's the thing. It, it, it's the opposite. The fact that you have to balance is what you don't want. Because right? you don't want those little muscles getting in the way and possibly getting injured. Gotcha. If in fact that was even true, which it's, it's, it's really not. So you don't want to be in an unstable position when you train. That's crazy. Anybody who says, yeah, you got to work in an unstable position, that they should just have whatever it is they have that stripped from them that allows them to train people, license or you know, certification or whatever. So, if somebody comes to you and say, hey, listen, Fred, I want a six-pack. That's my goal. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I want to I wanna go out to the beach. I want everyone to look at me and say, you know, that guy, you know, he's right. chiseled up. What would you tell them? Clean up your diet. What do you eat? And I'm sure that if they have fat over their abs, they are eating a diet that is probably high in carbohydrate. 
um, because they're not allowing fat to be released from the fat cell because they have chronically high insulin levels. Mm -hmm. So they're going to, because men mostly store fat on their, around their belly and waist, yeah. uh, their abs are being hidden by a layer of fat. So you can't exercise your fat away. So now, you know how some, some guys are lean, like you look at the bodybuilders, one guy has six pack, one guy has an eight pack. Yeah. Some guys have a four pack. Some guys have four on one side, six on the other. Huh. Have you ever seen that? Never noticed that. Yeah, no. it's totally genetic. Wow. Then there are people who have, uh, so you have one guy and he's lean, he's got a six pack. He measures body fat, he's 12% body fat. Then you have another guy, you can't see his abs at all. He's lean, but you can't see his abs at all. You measure his body fat, 12%. So you can have a low level of body fat, but store most of your fat between your skin and your muscle, oh, okay. as opposed to storing most of your fat behind your muscle, so that your skin is sort of like paper thin. You ever see guys like that, who's, and even women sometimes, their skin looks like it's tissue paper. Yeah. Right. Um, from what I've read, that's often the case in, in that's a genetic thing that is often caused by heritage. I just seriously oh, okay. So if your heritage is from climates that required heat to dissipate, then you're more likely to have that tissue paper thin skin because heat is radiated out of the body through muscle. Now, if you come, like me, if you come from colder climate places, like my answers are all from Russia and Scotland, you would have the tendency to have the fat here. So that when, this, so that when your muscles radiated heat out, stay it in. Gotcha. So, um, uh, you can get lean and not have visible abs. In that case, uh, tough. It's it's just the way it is. So it's it's not. There's no simple solution for somebody wanting you know six pack abs. No simple solution. Just eating right, and hopefully you have the genetics to have it. And of course you want to strengthen the muscles of the abdominals, and then 